Uh, can we get underway, please? Uh, I should say boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Um, okay, Louise, thank you. Okay. Um, good evening and welcome to the 3rd of October meeting of Cabinet. Councillors and officers are reminded to put their mobile phone or electronic device on silent if they have one near them and not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and microphones. Please would remote <coughs> participants mute microphones when not sp speaking as this will reduce feedback and background noise and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. Members of the council joining us remotely should leave cameras on. Officers leave cameras on only when the agenda item you are speaking on. After each item has been presented, I will invite members present in the room to ask questions first. Those members joining us remotely will then be invited to speak, and they should indicate their wish to do so, uh, raising the hand, raise your hand facility. Only those members of Cabinet present in the room will be making decisions, and I will confirm the result verbally for the benefit of those watching the webcast. Okay, uh, agenda item one, to, um, the minutes of the last meeting to be be confirmed as a correct record of the proceedings and will be signed by me. So Do you all agree? Move. Thank you, Malcolm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, are there any apologies for absence, Louise? Uh, Councillor Holmer, Chair of Council. Thank you. And item th agenda item three. Are there any additional agenda items, Malcolm? Yes, Chairman, there is an additional agenda item. The item on the uh, discharge of sewage and Bexhill Beach water quality. Thank you. And are there any urgent items, decision items? No, there are no urgent items. Okay. Um, agenda item five, disclosure of interest. Members, please speak clearly if you have a personal or personal and prejudicial and say the agenda item it refers to. No. Um, so with no um, members <coughs> uh, referring to a personal or prejudicial interest uh, will be asked to temporarily leave, but there's nobody who's declared that, so no one will be leaving. Okay, so agenda item six. This is the, um, let me just get it copied here. Ben, this is your report following the um, technical advice notes first homes and 100% affordable housing, housing that was um, discussed at scrutiny last Thursday. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. Um, so uh, we presented um, a, a number of technical advice notes, which are effectively sort of a, an officer interpretation of uh, existing policy to the overview and scrutiny committee for consideration. There was also a recommendation made that the, um, that the scheme of delegation be changed so that um, officers uh, could uh, consider the, the app, any application for increase in affordable homes on, a, on, on any site in accordance with the technical advice note that was, that was provided uh, relating to 100% affordable housing. Um, following that, the, following a, what a pretty robust debate between, between the members of that committee, uh, final resolutions uh, were, uh, the members have been handed around a, uh, an additional thing. I think just, just to clarify, the resolution uh, number one, uh, I think if, if, I'm, if I'm correct in thinking, was actually um, not put forward to Cabinet so that the, uh, it was not recommended from the, um, from the committee that uh, any change to the scheme of delegation be made. Um, in terms of the two technical advice notes, the, uh, the three technical advice notes, uh, first homes was, uh, the first homes technical advice note was resoundingly approved of. The 100% uh, affordable housing note was disputed and there's a task and finish group that will be set up uh, to explore the technical advice note around Bexhill Town Centre. So really, um, the, uh, the, 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 the recommendations coming to Cabinet today are uh, relate to the uh, approval and, and recommend um, uh, and support of the, the first homes technical advice note and that we be able to uh, to publish those that note um, in accordance with so to, to provide further guidance to uh, to applicants uh, looking at looking at housing development uh, I'm, I know that Jeff Pyra our plan policy manager is on, on online with us today so if we have any further if the cabinet have any questions related to this he's able to address the technical specifics other than that um, happy to answer any questions, Chairman. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Ben. Are there any um, members here that would like to ask a question? Uh, Catherine. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I've got two, actually. Um, I do need to stand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've got Sorry. an issue with <laughs> sitting. Um, <laughs> yes, first of all, I'm not a planning committee member, so this is my first brush with um, TAMS, and I'm just wondering why a appears on the face of it to be a planning committee matter, has come to <coughs> cabinet at all. And my second point is this. We've had it emailed to us, every single one of us. I'm not quite sure why we've got a paper copy as well. Thank you. I will now sit down. Uh, yes, please, Ben. I'm, I'm happy to address the first of those points. Um, the first point was basic, basically it was identified that there appeared to be a potential conflict between... Um, operation in terms of scheme of delegation and the potential for delivery of uh, corporate priority objective in, in terms of delivering affordable housing. Um, with regards to that, we decided to bring uh, write a technical advice note, um, you know, uh, advising on the policy. And the only reason it really went to um, to overview and scrutiny was was around recommendation number one, um, which was regarding the, the change to the scheme of delegation, which. Um, uh, I felt was, was a matter of policy and therefore it was appropriate that it should be discussed at overview and scrutiny and go through this mechanism through cabinet up to full council rather than necessarily going straight to planning committee who, yes, you're right, do have the ability to change their, their scheme of delegation in this matter. But it was, um, it was about a conflict between scheme of delegation and policy. I think resoundingly the overview and scrutiny committee considered that they, they didn't feel that this was an issue. Um, and that's why they decided not to recommend to Cabinet any change to the scheme of delegation. Okay, thank you, Ben. Any other questions? Uh, Jonathan. I'll speak after everyone else has spoken. So. Okay, anybody else want to make any comments? Uh, Terry, Terry Byrne. Thank you, Doug. Um, this is a more general comment about technical advice notes. Um, that a lot of this is interpretation and it's officers' interpretation of the regulations. I uh, obviously drilled down into the housing ministerial statement and there are some areas which are, which are open to interpretation so all I'm, all I'm just sounding a, a warning to other cabinet members that always go back to the original documentation because with the best will in the world the officer's interpretation uh, we are the final guardians of how that is interpreted and how, is, how it is implemented. So I think it behoves us all to go back to the source documentation, not purely rely on, on what is, after all, the digest. Okay, thank you for that, Terry. Are there any other questions, uh, comments? Christine, Christine yes. Bader. Yes, I would like to say thank you very much um, to the Overview and Scrutiny Committee for um, uh, rejecting the note on the Town Centre Conservation Area and, and uh, for setting up a task and finish group. And uh, my plea would just be really to make sure that we include, um, have a pro you know, full consultation with stakeholders. So, um, I mean, uh, the chair was very kind to invite um, Bexhill Heritage and Bexhill Chamber of Commerce to uh, make a presentation on, uh, um, on Wednesday, uh, Thursday evening last week. Um, but I think it's really important if we have a task and finish group that we actually include stakeholders. So it would be really important for me that that was included in the terms of reference. And I speak as not only the ward councillor, but also the sort of chair of what was the town centre um, steering group. Thank you. Presumably any um, technical notes don't only just apply to Bex Hill. So battle is a conservation area. Yes, yes, and Rye does, presumably. Robert's Bridge does. So, you know, is there some reason why it's just Bexhill? There had been a number of applications recently and, and, and a number of situations where there was confusion about the application of, of the conservation area rules around windows specifically, and so uh, about the replacement of windows and updating windows. So it was because obviously every conservation area is different, you know, what makes it, a con you know, what makes it worth conserving and, and what are the key issues in that. This specific technical advice note centred on Bexhill Town Centre rather than any of the other conservation areas, which may have different 
different uh, aspects applicable to them. But it primarily centred, quite frankly, on Windows. On Windows. Yeah. So Windows, yeah. So therefore, if there was any uh, thing coming forward from uh, any of the other towns, we would apply the same rationale behind it all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Paul, would you like to, uh, um, Councillor Osborne, make comments? Thank you, Paul. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, um, quite a quite a robust uh, um, uh, discussion on on Thursday, which sort of took me by surprise a bit. I, I had invited um, Guy Louise, um, the, um, the two speakers from from, from Bexhill Preservation and and, uh, and the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and then sort of slightly embarrassing we had to send them home without saying anything but um, <laughs> they were happy I think I think they were happy in, the, in, in that they didn't have to speak because they got what they wanted in that there would be a task and finish group looking at it and they would be invited again to uh, to, to, to sort of input on that uh, so so we can get it right um, that what, what you said chairman about does it include Bexhill and um, uh, Battle and Rye as well um, I sort of wondered that, but, but as, as, uh, as Ben's, Ben has said, the, um, the, the sort of conservation areas are completely different. And, and in, in Rye, if you, if you fitted a plastic window, you'd be marched off and, and stuck in a tower, I think, um, before you'd finish fitting it. So, um, and in Bexhill, I don't think it's sort of so sort of tight as a conservation area. Um, and I think that's where the concern was that, you know, some places have, have got, you know, I, I had an hour's tour around with a, with a, um, with a county councillor before my meeting on Thursday just to see the issues. Um, so I was up to speed as well. And you, you see some, some have got good windows, some have been redone nicely, some are plastic and you can't tell they're not plastic. And then some of them are, are, are just falling out where the, where the people, you know, I'm told, you know, don't know what they can do and what they can't do. And they're sort of being told, you've got to do such and such, but they don't want to pay the money, and, and, and it's, it's all a bit awkward. Um, and people want to be as sort of environmentally friendly as well with double glazing. So, yeah, I, I think a task and finish group would hopefully tidy it all up and, and, and get a good outcome for everybody. Um, I just sort of made a quick note. We had the three, three technical advice notes to look at. And the first one I wrote down good, um, which was uh, affordable homes, um, so that was easy peasy. The second one, which was the change from, say, uh, on a large site, specifically in a parish um, or a village where you've got, um, you know, a 40% mix of, of shared ownership, rental, and then private. And the concern was there where they turn into where maybe a social landlord would come along and say, well, I'll buy the lot. And there's a concern there that you get, you know, 100% rental properties, which may not. I don't know. People are concerned over that. But then the other side of the coin, as, uh, as Ben mentioned during the meeting, was what if, say, a pension fund or a bank who are now invested in, uh, in, in rental properties, what if they were to come along and buy the other 60%? So say, for example, you've got you know, a social landlord buying the 40%, the builder puts the rest on the open market, the open market, someone with deep pockets, such as a pension fund, comes along and says, we're having them. What, what, what do you do then? How, how do you cross that bridge from 100, going from 40% shared to 100% shared, but not shared ownership or anything else, but, you know, private, you know, 60% private rental? Is that, I don't know how you cross that bridge. So that's something that needs to be sort of looked at because the idea of sort of mixing in, you know, private rented, social rented and private owned sort of goes out the window if, 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 you know, a lot of them are bought as, as not as second homes, but as, you know, specifically for rent by, a, by an investment firm or an investment company or, in, you know, an insurance pot or something. So that's, that's a difficult one um, to cross, but that, there was concerns over that. And then the tan free, the Bexhill windows, task and finish group to be set up, seemed a sensible option, and uh, hopefully that satisfies the two ward members as well who have contacted me and you know, hopefully it will all be good. Thank you.
Okay, thank you for that, Paul. Um, and perhaps when the task and finish group does get together, because if it's, if it's about windows, then there should be a common sort of policy, I should think, you know, whether or not there are applications that come through from, from other towns or other villages. But that's something else that you can look at when you get together. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to add some comments to this, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. I'll sort of deal with them in a uh, slightly reverse order, I think, or in a different order than they appear. Uh, I don't think there's any issue... Well, firstly, I, I personally had no understanding as to why these towns were written or came forward at all, because there's nothing in them that a, an officer wouldn't write you in an email uh, if you ask the question or, or tell you. They're just explanations of how they interpret policy, which if you want to look at on a, on a national level, you have the NWPF and then you have the NWPG, which is the guidance which sits behind, beside the NWPF to explain how you should interpret the policy or the things that surround that. So uh, I, I was a bit sort of surprised when given those to read, uh, but they're there. And um, they, of course, will start a discussion, and that's all fine too. There doesn't seem to be any disagreement on the first TAN, on first homes. Uh, and so uh, my own view on that is, is that uh, if uh, officers want that published, then that's absolutely fine to publish. Uh, I think the issue on the... Uh, windows in Bexhill, we've seen uh, two applications come forward on that, uh, one that went to appeal and was actually uh, upheld, uh, uh, upheld at appeal, uh, and so allowed some uh, PVC windows to be implemented. There's a very big difference of opinion between the conservation officers, the, uh, the owners of properties, uh, other members, uh, and Bexhill Heritage as well. And I have spoken to Jeff Pyra today uh, and before about this issue, and I suggested that perhaps for the task and finish group uh, it might be wise to see if we can get also input from, um, uh, from uh, English Heritage as well uh, to, to get some outside input to try and find a resolution because the issue with Bex Hill Town Centre is that for years people have been installing yeah. PVC windows and they have gone without enforcement. So you then create a situation where you have a conservation area which hasn't been conserved or in the the conservation enforced as it was meant to be, and that creates a problem. Uh, I've also there's also been discussions, and I, I've raised the issue myself on if, if there is a if there's any way that a grant stick scheme could assist in this area as well. So I think a, a task and finish group uh, is an unusual way to deal with a, a planning policy matter, uh, and but I don't have any objection to it whatsoever. And if it allows everyone to come forward and bring their thoughts to the table. The one input that I would have, or the couple of inputs, uh, and I should uh, should at this point thank um, uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Osborne, for allowing me to say a few words at the scrutiny committee. I certainly didn't want to engage in your debate, but to, occasionally there is a, a need to to be there to to speak or to answer questions from a member's point of view. But I would really ask that group to uh, include a survey of the town centre, so we actually know what the the size of the problem is, or, or the you know exactly what the situation is with both PVC windows and wooden windows and just an external visual appraisal of them without going into enormous detail. It would probably take somebody a half a day or a day to walk around and, and do that. That would be useful. And I would also uh, just ask you to be sensitive to the, um, to the resource available with if planning officers are going to be involved because they are also trying to do the local plan at the moment and uh, their resource at the moment is not particularly... Um, uh, expansive. They can't just sort of turn themselves to anything. So I would just, just say if you can keep that in mind as well. I'm not sure. I don't think they know who's expected to be doing it at the moment. So I think there needs to be a discussion on that as well. But if that group comes forward with uh, some good recommendations, just keeping in mind also that there are, there are there's significant national guidance on this and, and, and anything that you come forward will have to be defensible at an appeal level as well. So that, that, that's a really important thing. So you need really good evidence. You know, because it, with, with planning, it's all about evidence. Uh, so I would agree with the recommendation put forward by scrutiny on that. Uh, on the 100% affordable home housing, I wasn't convinced when listening to the meeting that necessarily everyone truly understood what this was about. Uh, and in fact, a little while ago, there was an application coming forward for her screen, which uh, Optiva had bought and wanted to move to 100% affordable housing. And I arranged with uh, Jeff Pyra and Joe Powell to conduct a, uh, a presentation which was to the Alliance members but was also offered to uh, all other members because that's the policy of the council. 
uh, to do that on affordable housing to explain it in better detail. Because one of the things that is not truly doesn't seem to be understood is that shared ownership and, in fact, first homes are effectively market homes, but they're just under the affordable banner. So when you speak about a sort of mixed you know, group or whatever uh, of housing, where you have shared ownership and first homes, it's no different to having what you would regard as market homes. And all this TAN is doing is saying that, that we will consider uh, these sort of applications in principle. At point 11, it actually makes that pretty clear. Uh, it doesn't say it's going to change policy DHG1 because you can't. Um, and it does say that uh, it concludes whether or not specific schemes up for, uh, for up to 100% affordable housing can be supported will come down to their compliance with adopted policies. So it's like every planning application, it's on its merits. And, uh, and I don't see any reason why you wouldn't uh, publish this because uh, it's not actually saying it's going to do anything more than what happens right now. Uh, so uh, I differ from scrutiny on that a little bit because I'm not convinced that there was enough time of scrutiny for those things to be explained in the sort of level of detail. But I would encourage anyone who didn't go to that uh, discussion presentation on affordable housing, if they want to have that again, I'm sure the officers would do it because I thought it really... I think a lot of people who went to that meeting came out with a different view. Uh, and that takes us to the... So, so we've, got, we've got TAN 3 going to scrutiny, TAN 1 for publication, and my recommendation for TAN 2 is publication as well, and with also not a formal recommendation, but a suggestion that anyone who didn't go to that presentation, maybe we can have it again. It might have been recorded, I don't know. And that takes us to recommendation 1, uh, which the scrutiny has said uh, no thank you to, uh, and uh, I would also say no thank you to uh, if I'm being asked, which I am, uh, because um, <laughs> this was a this was a this was a decision by the planning committee, and uh, I do accept that it was it was it was generated as a result of a number of applications coming forward with viability assessments to reduce affordable housing, and I think the committee was getting a little bit uh, a, a bit knocked about that. Uh, however, the committee did have a very good presentation and training session on viability and, and I think understood clearly after that that, that uh, whilst you have a policy, you're unlikely to ever achieve that policy and, and a number of examples were given across the country of different councils and their policies and, and how much affordable housing was achieved. The planning committee has had to make decisions on applications from zero affordable housing, Thomas Peacock in Rise, that example, to 100%. Uh, and that is her screen, which, of course, was a mixed scheme, not just people think of social housing. It's not just social housing. You know, it's shared ownership, and, and I can assure you that normal people live in shared ownership housing. Uh, I know a, uh, a good friend of mine who is a, uh, doing her, her doctorate in, um, in a medical area uh, lives in a shared ownership house. So uh, it's, uh, it, it, they are just the same as, as uh, uh, market houses. I don't, think it would, I don't think it's the right thing to change it, ask, it, ask another committee to change the delegation of the committee that made that decision whilst they made that decision based on reduction in, in, in affordable housing. It didn't mean that they didn't want to see uh, any other Section 106s of the same topic. Uh, but I also don't think, and I think I have um, uh, a sort of cross-party agreement on this, from uh, the telephone call I received today uh, uh, from uh, Councillor Maynard, that, um, uh, that any of us feel that this level of delegation should be vested in one post. Uh, and I think that's a very long uh, explanation and summary. So uh, my recommendation would be uh, not to adopt the recommendation uh, one on that list. Right, thank you, Jonathan. Are there any uh, other members here? No, I've got Councillor Cortell with his hand up. Paul. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of comments on the uh, Town 3 about the windows in Bexhill Town Centre, uh, which is in my ward, or mainly in my ward. Um, uh, you mentioned... Um, uh, um about 
conformity with other towns, I think, in Rother. Um, I think the situation is a little bit different for two reasons. Um, first of all, there's a level of prosperity in the uh, centre of Rye, the centre of Battle, and the centre of Robertsbridge, which isn't the case in the centre of Bex Hill. Um, and uh, it is much harder to find investors in the centre of Bexhill to um, raise, um, uh, to install windows to the same standard. And we risk um, uh, having w rotting windows, leaking windows, and moving in, in, into a situation of further poverty if um, the situation isn't reviewed. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is that, as one speaker said, there hasn't been proper enforcement over a long period in Central Bexhill. Therefore, a lot of windows have probably been installed without planning permission. And um, there are an enormous number of UPVC windows in the, in, in, uh, in the conservation area now. So the situation is somewhat different from the other conservation areas in Rother. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those comments. I'm sure that will come out when the um, um, task group get together. I think there is obviously a, uh, to make sure that you don't prejudge anything that's going to happen, Paul, um, because I think until such time as that's the case. Um, uh, Councillor Carl Maynard. Carl. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. And, and certainly um, I'd like to echo the comments that have already been made um, about the robust debate that we had at Scrutiny about um, these, these three um, tens, as we've called them, um, as, as they're called. Um, but um, to be absolutely clear, um, following that telephone call today, I, I understood that Councillor Vinehall was going to support the scrutiny recommendations, but that seems that that's, that's not the case. And let me be absolutely clear, as I said um, at the scrutiny meeting, um, when you've got controversial planning applications, I mean, whatever ward they are across rather why wouldn't you want the most transparent process possible to make sure that, that a good quality planning decision is made so for me any controversial planning applications should clearly go through um, the planning committee and suggest that you have a scheme of delegation on what would potentially be the most controversial sites in any particular ward seems to me to be exactly what you shouldn't be doing and it's very clear that in terms of public interest in in those those particular planning applications, that the public would rightly expect and the parishes would rightly expect, those parish councils would rightly expect them to come to planning committee. So I have to say I was very surprised to see uh, that scheme of delegation coming forward, because it would seem to me um, that in terms of wanting to be transparent, wanting to make sure that quality decisions are made, that you make sure they were made a planning committee. In terms of the, the first town, I think there was broad cross-party agreement um, that that, uh, that was to be supported. In terms, clearly, of the um, question about setting up a working group, I moved it, Councillor Carroll seconded it. That received broad cross-party support to, to make sure um, that this authority gets to grips with the issues around um, uh, windows within conservation areas. But on this issue about 100% social housing, I want to strongly take issue with some of the comments that Councillor Vinehall has made. Uh, we've, we've made them for a very long time where his interpretation of what a shared ownership property is and what an open market property is, is very different to mine. A shared ownership property comes under the umbrella of, of, of affordable, so those affordable properties are either shared ownership or social rented. And then, as was, as was, was said at the scrutiny committee, when I made that speech about um, the public expecting through that local plan process that had consultation and the public um, expect to see on those sites um, a, 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 a majority of open market um, housing available um, for people to buy. And, and as we've said before, the idea of pepper potting so that you get a proportion of, of social rented, a proportion of shared ownership and a proportion of open market is what we as an authority for many, many years have said is the correct way um, to make sure that we get a balance of affordable and open market housing. What is proposed around the 100% 
uh, social housing doesn't achieve that for the reasons that I set out at the scrutiny committee. And I and I'm sure other councillors would be fundamentally opposed to under a scheme of delegation for it to come forward that you would actually leave it to an officer to decide. Uh, and as I say, I thought that Councillor Vinehall would support that proposition that was properly made order, yeah. Uh, yeah. by the scrutiny committee. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, I'm not quite sure that's absolutely right, Carl, because I wasn't sure that the dedication. Jonathan, well, can you yeah, just um, yeah, clarify can, that? Yeah, well, uh, we, we are recommending that, rec that recommendation one doesn't go ahead, which, is the, which would allow any Section 106's effect affordable housing to come to planning committee. It's as simple as that. But I would also make a point uh, about um, shared ownership. Uh, it, it is accepted that shared ownership falls under affordable housing, as does first homes. Um, we're not talking about 100% social housing. That's a different, that's a different definition. But I, also, I would also point to Councillor Maynard's uh, last election leaflet, which I have in front of me, uh, point four out of his um, five great reasons to vote for Carl and Jim. Uh, it says, uh, we, uh, at, at, that's five, there's actually six. So there was a, there's, a, there's a, a, a bit of a, a, um, uh, a numerous issue there, but I we'll, we won't bother with that. Uh, we will support shared home ownership schemes helping people onto the housing ladder. That's all I can say. So I'm, I'm surprised that uh, Councillor Maynard now says that he doesn't want to fulfil his um, uh, election manifesto. But Chairman, if I may be able to respond, oh, oh, um, and I want to thank on, Councillor Carl, Vinehall for, can for, we just, for... Excuse me just a second, there's somebody else wants to speak. So, um, well, I think you should be able to respond to a comment that another councillor's made, but certainly I defer to the other councillor. Yeah, thank you. Um, councillor Prozier. Thank you. I certainly agree with what we should be doing, which is being open and accountable. So I'd really quite like to hear from the officers about the need for progressing these sites in a way that means that we can do it more quickly through delegation. So that's the part that I didn't understand, and which obviously Councillor, um, uh, you, you, Councillor Vinehall has said that we wouldn't support that, that the delegation is actually given to one officer, that it's not what we would want as a council. But then I, perhaps I don't understand the reasons particularly, and maybe we should get the... Um, um, social providers, social housing providers in to also explain to us because I think we need to understand that. Uh, the other thing that I would like to say very clearly is um, Councillor Maynard talks about controversial sites and I really really do not like the tone and the language around this expression because reading between the lines is saying that it's all social housing. And as has been explained, it's not social housing in the sense of the old-fashioned estates where you had um, social housing as one block. It's just not like that. And we had a very, very, very good seminar delivered by Jeff Pyra. explained that on the Hurst Green site in particular. And to be honest, if I had, and I have sites in Robertsbridge, that came as 100% affordable, meaning shared ownership and rented, I would welcome it with open arms. The worst phone calls I have are, I need a house in Robertsbridge. I need somewhere to live. And there's nowhere. There's, I, I say there's no point in even asking. There's no point in asking. We, there's such a shortage for our young people. And shared ownership, uh, we all know people, professional people, who are living in shared ownership. So I think the tone, the language, and the fear mm. that is set running is just not acceptable about this expression, controversial sites. So I'd just like to express that. Thank you. Uh, Jeff. I know that you're with us at this meeting. I wonder whether or not there's any definition of those terms that were used that would be um, helpful at this stage. Uh, hi there. I I think I missed some of that, unfortunately. But, um, I mean, affordable housing has a particular definition in, in that it, re it remains affordable in, in, the long, in the long term. And it can be, um, it can be for rent or it, it can be uh, to buy but, uh, at a discount or, or as a share, shared ownership. So, yeah, they're the two separate products. 
Um, so it is affordable, but it also relates to the market in terms of being a discounted version of market housing. What what's what I said um, with Joe Powell when we we spoke at the Hearst Green application. Um, was that what it does is allows people who can't afford to buy on the open market to to get a foot on the housing ladder, and you know have to meet they have to be local people, um, they they have to have a salary below a certain amount, so it's it's what we want you know it allows people who in the old days would have bought on the open market to to, to buy on, on new housing um, at a discount, um, on the knowledge that it will remain as affordable housing in the future. Thank you for the explanation, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, Councillor Maynard, do you want to make a further comment before I've got sat Councillor Sam Coleman? Thank you very much, Chairman. I think it, it's a little bit disingenuous for, for Councillor Vinehall to suggest that I'm not in favour of um, um, shared ownership housing. And as he points out, um, it's in uh, and was in um, my election literature, and I'm pleased that Councillor Vinehall carries that around with him. Um, but the reality is that in terms of the local plan where residents were consulted in the various parishes, in the various towns within Rother, they expected to see a proportion of open market, a proportion of shared ownership, which I, and I will put it on the record, think is an excellent idea, and a proportion of social housing, which I also think is absolutely an excellent idea. But there is a balance, and that balance is what we as an authority promised within the local plan. And I would urge Council Mrs. Prochet, if, if she feels um, that I'm not representing um, local residents, and these are controversial sites, and, it, and that's just a, a matter of fact. But I would suggest to Council Mrs. Prochet, if she's under any illusion as to what residents want in these various parishes, that she comes out perhaps to Westfield Parish Council, for example, and actually hears what parish councillors think about the policy of 100% affordable housing when it's in, co in conflict with what we've originally said and in conflict to, of the 106 that is already there on that particular site. But it's not just about Westfield, it's about the district as a whole. And it's about making sure that we get the balance of um, social housing, social, so in terms of social rented, shared ownership and open market housing, because that's what residents expect. Thank you, Chairman. Very good. Thank you very much for uh, those comments. Um, I'll invite Councillor Sam Coleman to make a comment, but, you know, this is basically around um, um, technical advice notes and where we're going forward. It was a complete debate tonight on um, uh, the housing issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Sam, you look rather um, red. Yeah, sorry, Chair. I, I was sat in front of a, a sunny window and it's now gone dark, um, so apologies. Um, I, I just wanted to comment. Uh, I hear this talk about balance all the time. Uh, when we're talking about affordable housing uh, and it's fine if you're talking about a balance of property there's that people need but <laughs> quite often i feel that councillors when they talk about a balance of different types of property they're actually it's a bit of a dog whistle for a balance of different types of people and as someone living in social housing um as someone who has residents every day email me um saying that they're looking for social housing they need social housing they can't afford even private rental they cannot afford any of the things that are out there that aren't social housing, they feel that they should be top priority, and yet there are numerous people above them on the social housing list, thousands of people on the social housing list. I, I feel like social housing should be our number one priority. And so when developers come forward with 100% affordable or 100% social, I think we really need to consider those much more favourably in, in light of the fact that we have so many local residents in need of those properties. Uh, and stop talking about this this sort of pepper potting in terms of sort of separating the riffraff, which is, I, I come to understand what a lot of people mean when they talk about okay. it. Thank you for that, Sam. I think we move on and get a, uh, this, uh, this matter um, resolved, and thanks for your comments on that. Uh, can we just sort of clarify exactly what we're now going to um, um, uh, propose on this, Jonathan, please? And then yeah, sure, there's someone I'll, to second I'll, uh, it, please. I will. I'll summarise that. So... Um, uh, in reverse order, TAN 3, Window and Bexhill Town Centre, to be uh, not to be published, but uh, to allow the uh, scrutiny task and finished group to um, progress with a uh, w with a um, project on that, and they can uh, set a timescale uh, in um, agreement with the officers, depending on resources as well. Uh, TAN 1 and TAN 2 to be published, uh, and recommendation 1 not to be taken up. 
Can you confirm that, Paul, that was as the scrutiny... Uh, slightly differently. Slightly differently, but effectively covering those points. Well, as, yes, <laughs> basically. Um, but ultimately, this is referring to council, so it's the final decision is not taken here. I'm sure there'll be further debate then. It'll be a long, long night on whenever it comes in December, I should assume. <laughs> okay. Thank you, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So we have a second for that. And those in favour of the uh, report as identified? Okay, Graham, I think um, no, I've moved forward too, uh, too far. Uh, Graham, I think you're going to present this report, am I right, or was it Lorna? Or, or Graham, Beth? Or Graham. <laughs> okay, this is the lease of rye allotments, yeah? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this relates to the two allotments in rye which are held under a single lease by the rye amenities CIC. Um, they were let uh, originally in, in 2013 on a 25-year lease, so the lease comes to an end uh, at the end of November in 2038. Uh, and it was a lease that was entered into at a time when the council was, was uh, devolving the sort of management of allotments across the district to, to local organisations and associations on very similar terms. Um, the lease has a, uh, a break clause which is operable by either party uh, with effect from the, the end of November uh, 2023. And that break notice requires uh, a, a, year's, a year's notice to take effect. So uh, the, the notice would need to be served by the 30th of November this year. Uh, and the recommendation, uh, Chairman, is that we uh, implement the break clause in the light of uh, the discussions that are taking place uh, with Rye Town Council <coughs> as part of the general development program of, of, of assets generally, um, in the interest really of, of, of uh, prudent, prudent management, given that um, it keeps uh, the options open rather than tying the asset down to a lease for a further 15 years after 2023. Uh, thank you for the explanation, um, Graham. Um, Lorna, did you want to add anything to that? I know you've also been involved with discussions with various parties. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, th I think this is quite straightforward and sim it's quite simple that we're progressing discussions with Rye Town Council. And as Graham says, this is a flexible way of keeping our options open. And I think if we miss this opportunity, that, that would be a shame. So that's all I wanted to add, really. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Prozier. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks to Lorna particularly and, and Graham for starting the talks because our, our focus has been on Bexhill. Um, However, we have started to, to look at other areas as well, and so it's very timely, this, and it's a very straightforward decision to allow flexibility on devolvement, which is what our policy is and what we want to be able to do efficiently and in partnership with, with Rye in this instance. So um, I really recommend it, um, and I'm happy to propose, um, propose this. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dixon. Kevin. Thank you, Chairman. I've got a couple of questions. Um, what happens in November 23 when we get them back and if we haven't got an agreement, do we have a backup plan? And secondly, um, Rye Town Council have emailed us uh, and provided evidence to refute paragraph 9 in the report. Does Graham have a comment on that? Graham. Um, with regard to the first question, um, I am aware that there is interest uh, from the Rye Allotments Association in taking on the management of the allotments, um, and they have uh, they have written to me to that effect, and I think they've written to one or two other members as well. Um, so uh, 
I think if, if we are in that position by November 2023, I think it will depend on the, on the timing of discussions with the Town Council. But I think we would want to keep those options open and, and have those discussions. On, on the question of the, um, uh, the status of the allotments, um, I think it wouldn't be prudent to, to make any formal comment without legal advice on that. I, I would say that our position has always been historically that they were not uh, statutory, but clearly that is an opinion that is not shared by the Town Council, but I, it's not material, I think, to, to, to the decision tonight. Just yep, for a while. Yeah. Does it really matter? Is the real question. Um, I would say, uh, in in um, in practical terms, probably not. In the sense that uh, there are no plans on, on the part, certainly on the part of, of this council, that I'm aware to do anything else with the land other than to to, to have them continue as allotments. So. I'm happy to second it. Right, so we have a proposal, we have a second, but Paul would like to make a comment. Please do. Thank you, Chairman. I, I suppose as a, as a past Chairman and Mayor of Rye, back in 2006 to 2008, I, I should comment. And there's no one else from Rye here anyway. So. Um, yeah, I would, I would welcome this, honestly welcome this. I know uh, when I was on the Town Council, um, trying to get the two councils to actually speak to each other was, was difficult enough. Um, uh, and, and now you actually sort of possibly moving into a, a, an element of agreement, which is, which is, which is really good. Um, but I would say um, 1974 have always maintained that they are statutory allotments and they are their allotments, even though they gave them up in 1974 which is one I couldn't get my head around because everywhere else kept their allotments but Rye didn't and the argument always was from old town councils was well well, we lost our clerk the clerk went from Rye and come and work for Rother and, and we didn't know what he was doing and, and they'd give up everything as much as they could and then spend 40 years arguing about it so um, so, so, so I would say um, obviously the email I've, I've not seen but you've seen um, coming from Rye Town Council still puts that marker down that they are statutory allotments. Um, so, so I think you just, as, as Graham has said, you sort of, sort of push that to one side and say, well, yeah, right, we don't want to do anything else. But I know that um, some, some years ago there was a potential of, of putting a cycle path on sort of a, a, a section of about six foot wide of the allotments off, off of South Undercliff. And, and that was like a tsunami of pain. To, to, the, uh, to the town council that they wanted to sell off the allotments to build this massive path and it was literally about the size of this table. So um, <laughs> it won't be an easy, 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 uh, easy route, um, but, it's a, but obviously it's a welcome route and, uh, and hopefully an agreement can be sought and everybody will be happy, maybe. <laughs> well, thank you for that very interesting story and background, Paul. I think we've all appreciated, and we can see it's a prickly thing to um, to deal with. But that's with officers to uh, take that forward. Uh, Councillor Christine Baines. Christ yes, it, it's really just to sort of make the point that um, you know if we can sort of move this forward, um, allotments are very much part of our, um, uh, or could be much, very much a part of our approach to cost of living crisis. Um, there's uh, plenty of evidence to show that people who grow their own food can do it so much more cheaply and feed themselves uh, so much more cheaply. So I think, there, you know, when we agreed our cost of living crisis at the last full council, I mean, some of us made that point about every bit of the council's policy. We need to look at it through that lens. And I've looked at this through that lens of... Uh, you know, affordable food, healthy eating. Uh, so ab absolutely, I support um, the, the uh, resolution. Jolly good. Um, so I think we're in a position to, um, uh, to vote on that and uh, authorise some um, officers to go forward with what necessarily has to be done. Uh, those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Graham. If we now look at the next item, which is agenda item... 
eight. This is the um, um, provide members with a formal report from the corporate peer challenge that was seemed to be completed an awful long, long time ago. Is almost in current timings, uh, feels ages ago. Um, and to agree an associated action plan, um, if I can leave this with you, Malcolm, to... Um... Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as you rightly say, I mean, it is, it, it's slightly disappointing that the report has taken about six months to, to come to us. Um, but um, that, that was, I have to say, down to... Uh, it took a, a long time for the initial report to come, and we had some comments on factual matters, which we, we went back to the LGA about. But... It, it's, it's now here with you. It will also be published on the LGA website. And um, can I say in saying all of that, that I do believe that corporate peer challenges are the right way forward in principle for local authorities, because if for those who have experienced in the past of the previous regime, it was very much focused on, um, on sort of you know, policy and having policy in place and how you did in that way, whereas the corporate peer challenge is much more looked at how you're delivering things and what you're actually achieving. I think there should be no surprises for anybody who took part in the process because actually most of the things they brought out were things that we told them about and they, so th th there were no surprises in there. Um, what we've done, Chair, rather than I don't propose to go through it all in detail, is there is a summary of the recommend, well, the Appendix 1 is the report, Appendix 2 is a summary of the recommendations and the proposed action and I'm very happy to... to um, answer any questions on that but if I could just finish by saying members should be reassured that that action we haven't waited six months to take to start doing anything the action was taken some of it was already ongoing at the time of the visit and it has continued since that time thank you chair uh, thank you for that Malcolm I, I think that on that um, the summary there um, I think the responses are such that many of these are implemented work in progress uh, I think the accepted is wasn't that we were accepting any criticism. It was just basically that we were aware of those, so uh, we were aware. Um, but if members wanted to go through any of these this evening, we can easily do so. Uh, are there any members here in the chamber that would like to uh, make any comments, please? Yep. Kevin. I'll kick off with number seven. Uh, create a capital program board. Well... That's ridiculous because we've already got a corporate, pro a corporate program board, which is the same thing. Um, and, and I don't actually think that that is a valid recommendation. And I actually think it should, I don't know what Malcolm thinks, but I think that should be rejected rather than accepted in part because our capital program board and our property investment panel and our financial stability program are all there and have been before this has happened. And I don't actually think another board would make any, any um, sense. Um, and in fact, we've actually combined to, to, to make more sense. So I would, I would reject number seven. Thank you. Malcolm, would you like to come back on that, please? Um, I would agree with Councillor Dixon entirely that, that setting up another board would, would, be, uh, would be just um, you know, in danger of repetition. I think when, it, when, I, when I wrote the report and said accepted in part, it was acknowledged that we needed to perhaps increase the focus on our corporate programme, but that was already being done through the existing... Um, board rather than a, 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 a another capital board so you know, I, I agree with I mean if, if you wanted to change that one to reject but I think there is a but to it which is we have achieved the emphasis on the capital program through the work on the corporate program board and combining that with a financial stability board uh, Catherine Catherine Field thank you my issue with this um, appendix is the language employed in it. It is in the public domain and I think the public read things not always in the same way in which we do in local government. The first column is the recommendation which you could read as an implied criticism i.e. if we need to do something else we weren't doing it before. And then to say accepted means I think to most people that we accept the criticism. What we have done is implemented it already and I think all those accepted should have said implemented or implemented in part and that would have sent a much more positive message, message out to the general public and anybody else who is reading this. I, I, I don't like the language. I'm sorry. No. Agree with you on that. Malcolm? 
if on the basis I wrote the report and included it, I'd probably have to say, no, I don't agree with it, but um, that's, that's up to members. Resources, etc., etc., um, but we're now in a position where we should be able to put most of these in place, so it is work in progress. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's another, uh, in the main report, it, it comes out more strongly, but if you look at um, Recommendation 3 and then Recommendation 5, Recommendation 3 says that we urgently increase capacity to deliver. Well, that means, in my, in my mind, that means we need more staff. Well, with, with more staff comes more cost, comes more expense. And in number 5, we're urged to deliver savings. Now, I'm not quite sure how you can take on more staff and deliver savings and all that, unless all those staff are either working for nothing or um, working for savings. I'm, I'm not really quite sure. So I don't... And in the actual body of the report, it actually it, it comes across stronger than that. So I think we need to be putting some comment in there saying that, yes, we'd love to have more staff, we'd love to be able to do more, but we can't afford it, as, you, as they acknowledge in, in point five. And there has to be a balance between what we can do and our budget situation. Uh, thank you for that, Kevin. Anybody else want to make any observations here now? Uh, I just wonder whether we can just go through and look at those, some of those responses while we've got a general consensus of opinion here. Sue? Just quickly ask if we can change the language according to the uh, issue that Councillor Field raised. Well, if I may check, the report is in the public domain, so it's there now. I mean, it, this is language that is used in, I mean, I think you'll find this, this is repeated you know, across the country. Um, if it is, but anyway, we, we will, we'll obviously have to agree to disagree on that one. If members wish to change that, that's up to, this response isn't going back to the LGA, it is just the response for this, this cabinet to consider. So it's not a response we put back to the LGA. Uh, Jonathan. Perhaps just to add another column for the purpose of the minutes, which uh, says implemented or part implemented or have text action. Because if people don't read the action statement, they can at least see that in a, in a single word something's been done. And I think that's what people want to know, that if there's been a review uh, and, a, and a recommendation, uh, whether it is sort of uh, complete or not, that, uh, that we have not only uh, accepted it, but we've reacted to it and we've implemented some change. And I think that's a reasonable thing to do. And to, to minute those things, you know, this is a report and there's a response to that report and uh, uh, it's just a pity it's taken so long to come through. Not, not our fault. <laughs> Implemented stroke work in progress. Um, and I think that that identifies that all these things were not uh, raised um, out, of the, um, out of the woodwork in any case. We knew all about them. And um, uh, I, I think it just shows the amount of diligent work that's been undertaken by officers in the meantime. Um, Terry, Terry Burr. Thank you. I was just wondering, could we, could we append to this report, which, as uh, Malcolm says, already in the, in, in the public domain, uh, a summary of the response maybe expanding a little on which ones we've accepted, which ones are on the way, just point, point by point, just matched up rather in the, in the way that uh, you were suggesting an extra column. Maybe a, just a, not a response, but a, a document for clarification, a position statement, as it were. Okay, there's another hand up over here, was there? Uh, Christine, sorry. Yes, I, I was just going to say about number eight. Um... Uh, proposals are in hand. Actually, we've, um, I know that I've been um, liaising with um, Melanie Powell about developing um, um, a report on uh, our COVID response plus um, our regeneration strategy moving forward post-COVID. And that is due, to, I think was due to come to this meeting, but is now coming to the next meeting. Is that correct? So it... it as I say, I think it would have been really good to say there is a report coming to your cabinet meeting in December um, rather than just accepted because I think we've, we're, we're a far... 
I think Malcolm's learned something tonight. <laughs> he wasn't aware of it. Get my crystal, get my crystal ball out. Okay, uh, there's a couple of questions on the screen. Um, I wasn't sure who was first, but Paul, you're the top right-hand corner. Can you hear me, Paul? Okay, uh, Sam, you're there. Would you like to pick up with this? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, steer Cabinet's focus towards uh, page nine of the actual report, uh, in particular the top two, top two paragraphs um, where it mentions both the climate change strategy uh, and the anti-poverty strategy as um, example evidence of, of good work being done by this council. Um, and I think the anti-poverty strategy, and I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, but rather to toot the horn of the um, collaborative working method of of devising strategy, um, I think has really been a success for this for this council um, and something to learn from going forward with other strategies. I mean, I know like Greater Manchester Poverty Action uh, have actually used our anti-poverty strategy uh, as, as an example of good work. And I'm giving a talk to the IGPP on it um, in December um, as an example of good work on, in that area. And I think the climate change strategy, similarly, actually listening to experts from external places, um, not only sort of eases up time on our staff and officers, um, but it allows that sort of broad um, bank of knowledge to make sure our strategies are informed. Uh, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention was that paragraph just underneath it, uh, which I think is something Cabinet can really take away from this report as a positive, where it says that staff and partners repeatedly stated that under the current administration, councillors are more visible and take a more active role in leading the organisation. Councillors, particularly lead members, are more engaged and provide challenge to officers. I think that is a really positive uh, thing to take away from this report that shows that this administration and this council going forward is really taking that bold approach and in leading from the front. So well done, Cabinet. Keep it up. Thank you for those comments, Sam. Uh, much appreciated. Um, are you back with us, Paul? Okay, so um, uh, I would like to propose that we can accept this, um, uh, this report, but I do feel that we'd like to perhaps just clarify some of those responses or have an extra column, whatever is the most appropriate way of doing it. And we can look at that when we get the, um, um, uh, the pre-publication of the minutes to make sure that they cover off our wishes. Uh, Chair, I had my hand up. Well, you weren't listening, Paul. I asked you to speak on two occasions. So you're back with us, are you? You, you were mute. Uh, sorry, sorry, I uh, thought you were talking about Councillor Osborne. I do apologise. Um, I didn't realise it was me. Um, yeah. Um, in, append in Appendix 2, Recommendation 1, um, I'd just like to ask the question. It says that cabinets have already informally reviewed the priorities and agreed the key areas to focus on. Um, and these relate to the delivery of key corporate objectives and will be reported to members in the usual way. Um, what is the usual way? Uh, Malcolm, would you like to enlighten um, Councillor Cortell, please? The, the usual way is through... Um, reports to scrutiny, reports to cabinet, that, that's the usual way of, of, of reporting issues to members and I think we've continued to do that through the, the emphasis on the need to you know, look at our budgets, to, to make sure we're managing those budgets, to look at the projects that we're doing and those reports will come forward you know, as and when. Okay, so at the moment we have a situation where cabinets have informally agreed some priorities but the rest of us will have to wait some time to know what these are presumably. No I don't think that is the case Paul. Uh, these are discussed on a regular basis obviously and therefore all that will, uh, will, will come forward so um, you know no, no one's not uh, advising you as to what's going on. I think it's all out there quite clear. Okay. Um, the second point I have is uh, the peer review took place prior to the surge in inflation. Will giving the staff a respectable pay rise um, in view of the changed circumstances be incorporated in the existing range of priorities? 
Um, well, I, I assure you that there is currently negotiations going on with, uh, with looking at the staff pay rise. Um, the Chief Finance Officer, uh, HR and the Chief Executive are looking at numbers which they which they'll be going to staff side to see what the position would be coming out from there. So um, I think we will be taking that into account. Thank you. Sue. One question, which is on the last one, on recommendation 12. Um, and one of the things in, in one of my areas, which is customer services, that was that's one area where data collection really was needed to make decisions about the way forward. Um, because we needed to actually understand where complaints were coming from, where inquiries were coming from, that kind of thing. And the action is that it says staff restructuring will deal. Um, I wondered if that modal is still the same. Is it still will deal or is dealing? If, if, if I may, Chair, it will deal. I mean, obviously what I can't do with anything is until we've agreed the pay rise and looked at everything is put together, what the restructure will look like. I, I'm not disagreeing with the council project, but I think the bits that we, we're very good at data collection, what we're probably, and what I think the team were focused on is actually some of the insight behind that and the analysis, and that's the bit that we, we need to deal with moving forward. I, I think actually that, I'm actually agreeing with you, but just in, in slightly different words, but that was the... Uh, that, that was what the team that came out in discussions, is not the amount of information we have. We, we, we have copious qual quality quantities of information. It's making sure you're making use of that to actually move things forward, and it will be dealt with. Will be, yeah. Um, so um, I'm very happy to remove this report with the amendments that we've identified. Uh, Someone to second that, and those in favour? Thank you for that. That's unanimous. Um, let's move on to the next item, which is the future of rail station ticket offices. Um, this was something that um, <clears throat> was raised previously, I think, in some dis discussion areas about the rumours that may ha happen or may not happen. Malcolm. Yeah, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, you're quite right. You know, a number of members had, had approached and said there were there were rumours or there, were, there, were, there seemed to be talk about this. What I thought would be useful to do was to, I mean, I think it would be wrong for us to get involved in rumours, but if those rumours do turn in to be factual, it's probably useful to be prepared. So what I've tried to do in this report is simply say, if it does turn out, and, and, and I'll just draw your attention to the fact that, uh, that you know, any closure would have to be in paragraph 9. It says they do have to be consulted on. So... It shouldn't happen overnight, um, but we're in a position to, we know what to do and we're ready to move if that, if that, if that position comes uh, into fruition. Uh, thank you. Uh, did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Oh, not a question. I just wanted to explain where this came from. Uh, walking down the street in Robertsbridge and I was tackled by several residents saying, what can we do to save our ticket office? Now, our ticket office in Robertsbridge is really special but then everybody will say their ticket office is special. Yes, yeah. um, I mean, it's extraordinary the service we get from our, our ticket office in Robertsbridge. And they said, what can we do to save it? And I thought, well, I don't know anything about this. So I went to the ticket office, spoke to the, um, the um, I don't know what the, the job title is called, but the person, Ross, who looks after the station there. And he seemed to know an awful lot about what was going to be happening uh, like they were going to actually um, close the ticket office, uh, staff would be asked to roam around with ticket machines, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we all know what that means, of the loss of service there. So he gave me, I spent a long time with him, and he seemed to have a lot of information. So then I went to the MP, and all the MP could tell me, uh, which suggests there's nothing on the table yet, was that there's going to be no redundancies, but that does seem as though something's on the table if there's going to be no redundancies. Meanwhile, Battle have started a campaign a petition, and I don't know how many people have signed their petition, but I can see Councillor Cook is, is indicating she would like to speak. The other thing I went, I went on to Becks Hill and talked to the Becks Hill station people there, and it was extraordinary to watch the service they give to people travelling. It's extraordinary. 
There were people helping big families and people in wheelchairs, push chairs through the barriers. And then the same person was down on the platform, putting a ramp up for somebody who was disabled to get on the train. And never mind all the complicated journeys that people make that they actually want to speak to people that you cannot get from a ticket machine. So I think that clearly there are going to have to be savings made. And I'd like to thank um, Malcolm Johnson for getting us ready for this because I think there will be a huge campaign. Battle, Roberts Bridge, Etchingham, Bexhill, they are really key things for our workers, for our community, for across everybody. Rye, yes, Rye, sorry. Yes, Rye as well. So, um, so that's why we brought it forward. And it may be that nothing's going to happen, let's hope. But we're ready. Yep, thank you for those comments. I think it is important that we are prepared for any possible um, uh, realisation of these rumours. Catherine. Thank you. Yes, I would very much like to support Councillor Brochak's comments. And I think it's important to remember that ticket offices do not just issue tickets. Yeah. And it would be so much easier to plan a complicated journey without them if the National Rail Inquiries app was any good and helped you to do this. But it's very clunky and it doesn't work. And there are occasions when you really do need to talk to people. And I have to say, some of the older, perhaps some of the younger people in um, our societies don't have access to smartphones, don't have access to the internet, and need to talk to people. So I hope that Markham's letter, when he writes it, and it's a really good idea, says that in the event of the rumours being true, that we would strongly oppose them. Uh, Councillor Dixon. Thank you, Chairman. A couple of things. Maybe it would be better with uh, resolution number one, after hearing the comments that, that other members have made, that uh, the Council is kept informed of any proposed changes to ticketing or staffing arrangements in stations within the district. Yeah? Ticketing and staffing arrangements within stations in the district. Yeah. And secondly, uh, and I'll bring in Councillor Osborne, this is surprising, because uh, I do read his tweets. Um, and, and also maybe ex expand the, the conversation slightly on the service that Southern give us on our Eastbourne to Ashford uh, rail service, which runs through the length of Robert. Um, uh, Councillor Osborne uh, retweeted something the other day about the reduction in, in rolling stock in, on that line, which is, is, call, is causing a lot of problems, particularly at the weekend, particularly for Rye. I, I had the pleasure of doing the whole journey and from Eastbourne to, to Ashford yesterday and back on a two-car train. And quite frankly, two cars is simply not enough. It was four, all through COVID, we had, we had four cars each way on that, on that service. It's only an hourly service. Um, and I believe because Southern have sold off some of their diesel trains, it's only a diesel line, the only diesel line in this part of, 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 the, of the county. Um, and it's simply not good enough that people are now forced onto two car trains that were four car trains, the same amount of people, in fact more people, because it's been the summer. And, it's, and, it, and people are being left behind, I understand, at Ryan, maybe Councillor Osborne. So maybe we could in, encourage Southern to... Uh, I see, see notices yesterday that this situation will carry on until the 10th of December. It's simply not good enough for a service. And I do think since the, the franchisees have been not receiving the, the revenue that they simply don't care less anymore. And that's simply not good enough for our residents. I'm not, I'm not invite Councillor Osborne. OK, thanks very much indeed, Kevin, for those comments. Did you want to make a response or a comment? Paul, please. Yeah, it's um, surprising that people actually read my tweets sometimes. <laughs> but, um, but, but no, no it, it's true what um, Councillor Dixon says. That, that, that it always used to be a two-car train. And then during COVID, when no one was on it, they put a four-car train on there, which seems, seemed crazy. And then when it's got busy again, they've, they've gone back to a two-car train. And, and to be honest, if, if Councillor Dixon sort of put up with a two-car train, he was lucky he didn't put up with a replacement bus because... Pretty much every day, um, there's a replacement bus, and I know this because they go past my house on the way to Appledore Station. Um, and the, the misery, honestly, the misery you see on a double-decker bus full to the brim of people trying to get from either, well, whether it's going just from Rye to Ashford, it, you just think, oh, what a complete nightmare. 
um, you know, a 20-minute 20, 20 train journey from Ashford to Ryde turns into probably a good hour on a replacement bus, trooping round. Um, no, not good. Um, so, so yeah, I would yeah keep keep an eye on it. They they supposedly going to a free car trains um, later on this year. Um, whether they do or not, I don't know. Um, but it, it's, it's not good. And, and, the, and the ticket office bit, I agree with everything people say. If I, whenever I go on the train, I just go, go and see the man and, and, or the lady and, and get the best deal. They know the best deal. You know, so if you wait 10 minutes, you can get that train and then you can go up there and you can get on the fast one. It doesn't cost you 140 quid. So, um, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's always best. So, um, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that um, update, Paul. And um, where are we on this now? Has anybody else wanted to make any? No, I've got two on the screen. That's, um, I think if you're waiting, Vicky, Councillor Vicky Cook. Thank you very much. It'll be no surprise to you to know that I'm going to speak very much in favour of public transport at a time when we're trying to encourage people to leave their cars behind, behind and travel by train. I think it is absolutely appalling that we will be expecting people to turn up at a ticket office where there is nobody to help them in their first journeys. It's not sufficient to say we can stick somebody in the ticket hall to sell tickets because at a time when people can be quite abusive and can be quite threatened, it's not particularly pleasant for the member of staff to have to face that. Recently, I took a group of girl guides from Battle Station all the way down to Brockenhurst to a girl guide camp. Uh, I, my friend had looked up the ticket prices on one website. I'd looked it up on Trainline website. My dear husband, Ron, popped around to the ticket office and got our tickets 30 or £40 pounds cheaper by going to speak to Jamie. The important thing about several of our railway stations, and I'm thinking particularly of Rye, Battle and Bexhill, is they are gateways to our towns. And we simply cannot allow visitors, tourists, residents to turn up at a railway station and not have a friendly face telling them where to go. And I know certainly that, as Bexhill, as Councillor Proshak has just said, and at Battle, um, you know, the ticket office staff are often the first people somebody will see when they arrive in our towns. And if we want to build our tourism, if we want to make our young people feel safe when they're travelling by trains, we have to put pressure to keep staff at our ticket offices. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing those comments. I think we all agree with them. Um, I'm certainly agree with them. I'm sure that uh, others do. Um, Councillor Sam Coleman. Sam? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think one word that Cabinet may wish to consider um, adding into this uh, is the word modernisation. Um, this is certainly the word, uh, in, from what I've understood from discussions with the RMT, the TSSA and all of the various unions involved in the current strike action, um, the sort of operators are telling them you can have your pay rise, but that comes with the cost of modernisation, which is very much, a, I think, a coded word for changes in staffing and reduced physical presence in favour of sort of technology. So I think including the word modernisation in there might be a, a helpful way to make sure we don't miss anything that is sort of squeezed through. I certainly noticed what others have noticed. I think um, when train operators realised that they couldn't get rid of onboard um, staff as easily as they wanted to previously when that was an issue, I've noticed as a regular train user myself that the onboard staff are now doing ticketing a lot more. They, they've been equipped with sort of better machinery to take tickets and to give people tickets on the trains themselves, which to me suggests that there may, I mean, this is again, this is just speculation, but there could, you know, be a move away from tickets in physical locations and instead trying to put all of those jobs onto the one member of staff on board a train who may also have to help the disabled person onto the train, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think these are all things that we should definitely keep an eye on. So thank you um, for bringing this forward to, to Cabinet. I think the whole thing is that um, we're going to keep an eye on all of this and obviously we, in consultation, um, if they come back to us, we'll be able to uh, look at it a lot closer. I'm just going to add into the conversation that uh, uh, this authority has committed close to a million pounds to uh, improve uh, the Battle Railway station, the crossover between the two platforms. I think given that sort of level of commitment that we're making to, uh, uh, to the railways, uh, 
think uh, we should be listened to, and that point might be included in any letter that's sent. Because mm -hmm. that is a significant uh, contribution. I think the train operating companies and network rail, so there's a difference there, isn't there? Not? Yeah. Okay, well, um, um, Catherine, are you going to pro propose this recommendation? <coughs> As, as amended, of course. Yeah. And second, as amended. Yeah. Okay. Vote, I suppose. Those in favour? Anybody against? Right. Where are we? Item. Um. Discharge of untreated water at Galley Hill, Bexhill Beach water quality. So this has sort of um, come forward. I think there was a motion at um, Hall Council recently, um, and I think that this is going to uh, reinforce our concern. Um, Malcolm, did you want to add anything to that? Because I know you've had meetings with Southern Water. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Just, just to brief you on that, I mean, there are two issues, really, as, as, as I see it, and I think as the report tries to lay out. One is the, the discharge of untreated water into the sea, which is one issue. The other one is more of an issue around the ongoing issues, particularly at Bexhill Beach, that are adversely impacting on water quality, which are not to do with the discharge of sewage into the sea. It's, it's more to do with something getting in at, at, at a point along the beach. Um, the, the report lays out where we've, we, we, we've the discussions that, that have been had that have involved both the leader and myself, along with the MPs, the Sussex County Council, and Southern Water. I had a meeting with Southern Water last week. Uh, one of the things that we've agreed at that, and, and I've also discussed this briefly with the MPs, uh, because we will need the coordination, is what we need to do over the course of this winter is to basically make sure that we know the location of every outfall from Galley Hill to Normans Bay, um, who owns that outfall and what's coming out of that. And therefore, by the spring, what we should look for is an action plan that leads to improvements in, in the Bexhill Beach water quality. That, that's where we are at the minute, Chair. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for that, Malcolm, and the time that you've taken in um, pursuing uh, Southern Water. Um, Councillor Project, Sue. Just a comment, really, is that... Um, this really, really important issue for the whole of the district, really, not just for Bexhill, um, for tourism, for all sorts of reasons. I really regret that, with one notable exception, none of the Conservatives were here for the discussion at full council. That, that was the exception, the notable exception. Richard Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think everybody is very, very pleased with the role that is being taken by the District Council and also by the Leader of the Council. I think that his participation in the debate uh, the other week was absolutely crucial. And so thank you very much for that. Um, I went to the WAVE demonstration on Sunday. Very, very large number of people there. And they spoke very eloquently about the way in which people feel deprived of their ability to use the beach, their opportunity to swim in the sea and so on. Um, and so I think one of the things that I think could be maybe amended about this, this uh, recommendation is it does talk about compensation for business. But I also feel that the individual people, the individuals, the human beings, the people of Bexhill, they deserve compensation as well. And, and, and the motion very carefully didn't specify what form it should take. But when talking to, the, uh, to Southern Water, I would like that issue of compensation for individuals as well as businesses to be raised. So that's the first point. The second point is, um, although the motion speaks about it, the actual recommendations don't speak about the need to actually upgrade the infrastructure. Obviously, we're going to need to make sure that the very old-fashioned infrastructure we have needs to be um, improved. In some cases, probably smaller diameter pipes replaced by larger ones, maybe new tanks uh, built, etc. Quite, quite fundamental changes might have to take place to the entire system. If it's going to cope with the existing outflows, but even more so, if it's going to cope with the increased outflows, 
coming about through building work in the town. So that's another issue I would like to see taken up. So, so otherwise, I think this is actually first-rate report and first-rate recommendations. I'm really pleased to see it. Thank you very much, everybody, for doing that work. Uh, thank you for those comments, Richard. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Councillor Tober. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on points, uh, excuse me, uh, my iPad died. Uh, on the recommendations, now, I know paragraph 9 in the document talks about compensation, but I'd, I'd really like to see a recommendation that uh, the Council actively seeks compensation. Um, whether I would want it as specifically as uh, Councillor Thomas has suggested for individuals, I think the mechanics of that might be difficult. Uh, who would be eligible, who wouldn't. Um, but certainly I, I feel the, the word compensation should come within the recommendations rather than be buried down in paragraph 9. Okay, so you uh, added to uh, paragraph 11. No, I'd like, I'd like a, third, uh, a third element in recommendation. We have recommendation 1, recommendation 2, paragraph 9 could almost move as a recommendation, with maybe a slight change in the grammar. Kevin. How about the, the issue of compensation be continued to be um, pursued with Southern Water by this, yes, council, fine. By this council? Fine. Will that, Malcolm? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Chair. OK. Does that cover your point, Terry? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Christine. Yeah, um, as um, one of the coastal um, councillors in Bexhill, I, I just uh, there's a couple of points I'd like to make. The one is a, a, around why we can't um, pursue Southern Water from an environmental health pers perspective. Um, I understand it's probably you want to tell me that it's the role of the Environment Agency um, to um, to take Southern Water to uh, to court if they continue to pollute our um, beaches. But I just wondered um, if you could s set out where the sort of boundaries lay. And the other point um, to make, and I understand very much the difference between uh, the, the discharge that took place from Galley Hill, but the almost daily um, advisory notices which are issued um, by um, the Environment Agency, uh, which we put up in two paper copies on the, the, the seafront, I think by the sailing club and uh, by the clock tower. There's a notice board there, which says today it's, there's an, a, a, an Environment Agency warning notice. Uh, say it's, it's um, advise, you're advised not to swim in the sea because of likely pollution. And obviously, if it rains, then it's probably you're getting the pollution. If it doesn't rain, then the advisory notice has been that. It's advisory notice. Um, several residents have said to me that they feel, as a council, perhaps we could do more uh, to make sure that those advisory notices are um, um, uh, publicised a bit better than just two paper notices that are put up in our, um, on our beach um, information boards. And finally, just to say, what a shame. I mean, years and years ago, when I was first on the council 30 years ago, this, t this town had a blue flag. It, was, it had a blue flag um, beach. I mean, we were so proud of Bexhill Beach. And to have got to this situation now is, um, I think really, really sad and disappointing. Okay, thanks for those comments, Christine. Malcolm, is, is there some way that, I don't know, the mechanics of getting these notices up? Is that, what does that fall, Ben? Is that, yeah? Perhaps Ben can help you out on that one, Ben. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think it would probably be best if I discuss this matter with um, uh, Deborah Keneally, who's our Head of Neighbourhood Services, yeah. before sort of committing to take, change any operations yeah. based on resources and stuff like that. But I'm happy to, to talk with the two ward members, um, well, all of the ward members, actually, I say all six of the, the, yeah. the coastal Bexhill ward yeah. members, uh, to discuss this matter after I've had a chance to talk it through. Because uh, we're not putting up a red flag, are we, to uh, identify 
you know, the red, what a red flag uh, is all about. So we're just putting notices up on two or three little notice boards. Yeah, I think we've got to be careful in, in ensuring we strike the balance between saying that there's a potential, and, and be very clear that the, the environment agency warnings are based on forecasts. They're not actual testing data, yeah. so it is based on forecasts. So we want to be careful not to scare people away from the beaches yeah. um, by, you know, going overboard with it, but ensuring that those people, especially the experienced sea swimmers, know exactly where they need to go to get their daily information. I was just going to clarify a li little bit on that. The RNLI... Um, area, the beach area where they operate in Bexhill, um, and this has been a bit of a bone of contention, um, that flies a red flag when the Environment Agency um, issue an advisory notice. They won't, they advise people not to go in the water, yet the, the bits either side of that, um, we're, you know, we're not, you know, we're not really policing those. Yeah, just if I may, and that's, that's, that's because that is the designated bathing zone for that beach. So that's where we recommend people who, who want to bathe into the water go to that area, and that's why the, the red flags are put up at that time. So it's, it's, it's the recommended and the designated bathing area for the beach. Okay, uh, Richard wants to come back. Yes, Richard. I'll hear you, Richard. My apologies. Um, thank you, Chair. Councillor Burns said it would be difficult to compensate individuals because of pollution episodes. But in actual fact, 11 water companies have actually been told to refund £150 million to their customers because of pollution infringements, etc., by next year. And what is actually happening is that certain water companies are being selected on account of their poor record. So it's a perfectly practical thing to do. And so I urge the council to pursue it, please. Yep, thank you for that. I'm sure we will, um, uh, you know, there's ongoing talks with them, Richard, so I'm sure that we will be in a situation where we can clarify that. Terry. Thanks. Um, in the press, there were, there were calls for massive compensation, and yet we're also looking at, hopefully, investment by the water company in its, in its infrastructure. Now, those two things, you know, if they haven't got any money because they paid it out in compensation, they're not going to be able to improve their infrastructure. So I really applaud this approach of working with the company with a long-term aim. So not just, not just a one-off one handout, but putting pressure on them to invest the money that they've still got left after the compensation in better infrastructure to cope with our particular situations on our coast. Well, I think the great thing is that we are in dialogue with them and we're in contact with them. Uh, I'm not sure whether the environmental agency are involved at this stage yet, Malcolm, are they? Um, there have been conversations, I know, between the MP and them, but not directly. And, and I know um, um, Hugh Merriman is keen to get everybody around the table, or actually more accurately, on the beach. Yeah. Right. Sue? I think you're worried about massive amounts of money. I think the companies make massive amounts of money. Um, I think the point that um, Councillor Thomas is making maybe could also be incorporated, which is it's the requirement for Bexhill particularly to have improved infrastructure uh, to deal with the problem, because I think that's the long-term solution. And, and yes, it's costly, but my goodness, which century are we living in? Uh, Malcolm, you'd like to just make a point, please? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's not in the report, but I believe, and, and, and the chair will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are 84 beaches in the southern water area. 80 of them are good or excellent. Bexhill isn't one of those, those 80. It's one of the four that isn't. What I'm looking for and what I'm getting in principle from southern water is that they are committed to improving the water quality at Bexhill Beach what I'm not in a position to do at this point in time is give them a list of things that they need to do it. I'm more interested in, and I think that, that um, Chair, you, you, you put this quite succinct, succinctly, is we want a blue flag back at Bexhill. So whatever it takes to get that. Yeah. Thank you. The other interesting point at one of the early meetings that we had, that there's a new uh, chief executive being appointed at the end of the year. I think the fellow that at the moment is called Macaulay who stepped down all the way and I believe his name is Lawrence uh, Gosden, and he has personally said 
that he's going to deal with this issue that occurred at Bexhill and come up with remedies. Now, these are not overnight remedies, but if you're getting a chief exec who's quoting that to his senior um, uh, uh, officials and to us in um, conversation, then that bodes well. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, support this um, uh, uh, um, motion to go forward and that Malcolm will undertake and um, continue to lobby. Um, are those in favour? Thank you. Have you seconded? <coughs> you were second it, were you, Hazel? Yes. I thought you were. Okay. All right, I think that brings us to the conclusion, does it not? So this meeting will close at something like 8.05. As amended, yes, yes. Uh, we can close the meeting.